this morning as Brother Campbell redirected the worship. My heart felt a little happy for the worship and because I thought that means Brother Wilson will preach tonight and I will be able to sit down, which is what I wanted to do. And then when he got up and said he, God gave him a good message, I said, now I know it's right. Somehow it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Before speaking to you tonight, I want to take my time to say thank you to Brother and Sister Campbell and the saints from Vichy. Our hearts have been blessed. Year after year we have come and we have never left without our hearts being renewed and we are thankful to God for them. We know it's a great work and all the saints and their heavy work and making the camp meeting effective our hearts of gratitude to go out to you and pray that the Lord will continue to bless you and keep this place open in spite of all that the devil does that we can find a place of refreshment. It would seem to me like it was just a few days ago that I was making plans to come to Vichy. Looking for, right, I was speaking to my travel agent to get search for tickets and such the like. And time went by quickly and then it was the day to come. And it seems like we've just Barely arrived, arrived, and now we are ready to leave. And you know, I thought, how so, how so, how much like life? Consistently, there are things that you want to do. There's all the planning for it. Then it comes, and it's gone. And then there's something else out in the future, and you get your plans going, and you work towards it, and it comes, and it goes. But you know, there is an event coming yeah. for which we must make adequate plans. Yeah. And it will come, it will arrive someday. And thank God it will not pass. Yeah. And so tonight I would like to challenge both save and unsave and encourage you with a certain thought. A couple of scriptures as our introduction. Hebrews chapter 9. And verse 27 says. And as it is appointed unto man once to die. But after this. The judgment. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 10 and 11. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that he hath done. Whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. We persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God. And I trust also are made manifest. In your consciences. Revelations chapter 2. Verses 8 through 10. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things set the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and thy tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Those last words. Be thou faithful unto death. 
and I will give thee a crown of life. Her thought tonight is finishing well. It seems that this is the main theme of all my messages, and it's, it's, it's the excitement of life. Salvation is the best gift anybody can receive. There is nothing in this life comparable with being saved. I don't care how much riches people accumulate. I don't care how much education they get. I don't care what pleasures they enjoy. There is nothing can bring satisfaction like salvation. And I want you to know I'm not saying that because I'm a preacher. I'm saying that because I've experienced it to be true. Salvation excites. Salvation brings delight. Salvation brings joy. Even when there's trials and problems and hardships and difficulties. Amen. Because we walk with somebody that knows the road. Amen. The Bible says, Jesus said, I will lead you with my counsel and afterward receive you into glory. Amen. David says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I'm glad I have a friend that walks with me all day long, 24 hours a day, even when I'm sleeping. Oh, the Bible says, he that keepeth his will, that not slumber nor sleep. So when I am asleep and Satan is planning for me, Jesus is awake. Amen. And he's taking care of me. Amen. Amen. The, 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 the old man said there was, he was worrying about his problems. And the Lord spoke to him and said, son, give me your problems and go to sleep. I'm going to be awake all night anyway. It's good to have Jesus on our side. Amen. I want the world to know I have not lost nothing by giving up sin. I want the world to know I have found the best there is in life. Amen. We are supposed to be God. I'm thinking in Spanish at this. You know, in the stores they usually, at least in Panama, there is a glass where they expose, they present all the things that are in the stores. What you call it? Okay, the displays, please. We are supposed to be God's display, please. Yes. Amen. We're supposed to be living in such a way that people look on us and say, I want that. Yes. Amen. If that's what's going on on the inside, I want to get in. Come on. We're supposed to make people envious of salvation. Yes. Hey, we don't need to envy their pleasure. We don't need to envy their riches. We don't need to envy their education. It's all going to pass. We need to make them envy our salvation. Because salvation lasts. When all the pressures and all the trials and all the education passes, Jesus remains. Jesus asked the question, at one point, for what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange of his soul? And so I want to read you a challenge that Jesus issued to some Jews. Luke chapter 13. Verses 22 through 28. And he went through the cities and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one of them unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house has risen up and had shut to the door, and ye began to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. 
And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Then you shall begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. And you yourself thrust out. Jesus was saying to them and, the, and to all mankind, the most important thing you can do in life is get right with God. The best thing that you can do for yourself is to get saved. He says, strive to enter. What he was saying is, get saved no matter what it costs you. Amen. What he was saying is, get saved no matter what you have to sacrifice for it. Whatever you need to give up, it will be worth it. And so tonight I'm right here saying to you, if you are not saved tonight, God is speaking to you. And God wants you to know that his longing is for you to get saved. I don't care what you have to give up. It will be worth it. I don't care what you have to sacrifice. It will be worth it. I don't care how hard it might seem to get saved. It will be worth it. So no matter what is it, it, your need is tonight. No matter what your situation is tonight. No matter what the demands or what you might have to give up. I promise you, throughout eternity, you will not regret having done it. So, get saved. For in the end, that's all that's going to truly matter. However, there is something in my mind of equal or greater importance that needs to be considered by all of us. Saved and unsaved. And that is the thought finishing well as important as it is to get a real relationship with God equally important or even more important it is to maintain it to the end I'm afraid that from the days of Jesus to today the history of the church is plagued by too many who had an encounter with God. Walk with God for a while. And then are gone. It has happened to people who get saved and in a week they were gone. It has happened to people who have hooked on for a year or two and they're gone. And it has happened to many who have lived alone. And that's hard for me to understand. How a person can walk with God for years and then permit the devil to turn him aside. And you know what? It has happened to people who have preached the gospel. Who have been stalwart giants for God. But somehow the enemy get in. And I will tell you this tonight. Please listen to me. If you get saved and you back off and you die lost, it would be better if you haven't been born. I think it's going to be more excruciating for that individual who have tasted of God and then turn his back for that one, that comparing with that one who never met God. So my friend tonight, my desire is to encourage you those who are not saved, whatever it costs you, stay saved. Now get saved. And saints of God, those who are saved, whatever you must sacrifice, whatever you got to give up, stay saved. Amen. Amen. Even when the ship seems to be rocking, stay on board. Amen. When it seems like everybody around you is failing, hold on to God. Amen. Amen. Salvation is a personal thing. 
Amen. I've told the saints at home, we act as a church, but we are not going to heaven as a church group. We have to go, each of us have to do it together. So God help us tonight. Whatever it costs, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trial will seem so small when we see God. One glimpse of his dear face all will erase. So let us run the race till we no quitting, no quitting, no giving up, no turning back, no matter what the cost. Hold on, young people. You can make it. Amen. I don't care who will fail. You can make it. Because God, Jesus died not only to save you, but to keep you. And the Bible says we are kept by the power of God. And that's a lot of power. What I like to do quickly tonight is to deal with two, two persons from the Bible who began, one began well and ended bad. And one began well and ended well. All right? One from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 17. I'm reading verses 14 to 20. This is just a background for this. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, shall say, I will set a king over me, like as the, all the nations are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy, thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he shall multiply horses. For as much as the Lord had said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and keep all, his, all the words of his law, and these statutes to do them. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren, and that he not turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left. To the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. First Kings chapter 3. Okay, I'm reading verses 3 through 14. And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense in high places. And the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. A thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer upon the altar. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, Ask what I shall give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast showed unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he hath walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is today. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen, 
a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this tiny, this thy great, uh, thy great people, thy, thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself. Nor has asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any rise up like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among thee the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David walked, then I will lengthen thy days. First Kings chapter 10. And I'm beginning to read at verse 23. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. And they brought every man his present, vessels of silver, and vessels of gold, and garments, and armor, and spices, horses, and mules, a rate year by year. And Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen. And he had a thousand and four hundred chariots, twelve thousand horsemen, whom he bestowed in the cities of char for chariots, and with the king at Jerusalem. And the king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones, and cedars made it to be as sycamore trees that are in the vale for abundance. And Solomon had horses brought out of Egypt, and linen yarn, the king's merchants received linen yarn at a price. And a chariot came up and went out of Egypt for six hundred shekels of silver, and on horse one hundred and fifty. And so for all the kings of the Hittites and for the kings of Syria, did they bring them out by their means? But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives. Princesses and 300 concubines. Let me tell you something. The last spirit didn't born yesterday. It's been going along for the longest time. And his wife turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wife turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wife, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God to of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. Solomon began well. He had the opportunity of choosing whatever. God signed a blank check and gave it to him. Philistine Solomon. And with all the choices he had, he said, 
Give me wisdom, Lord. Help me to lead your people aright. And that pleased God in a strong way. God had warned the people of Israel, don't mix yourself with the women around you because they're going to turn your heart away. Can I put a parenthesis here, please? Save one, don't get mixed up with an unsaved person. You are not, you're, you're probably not going to get them to get saved. Most probably they won't get you backslide. So if you're going to get married, make sure you marry within the Lord's plan. Solomon indulged himself in pleasures and riches in abundance of all kinds. And it was beyond all that which the people of his day had. And then Solomon preached. I pray. Will you pray for me, please? Will you pray for me? I'm pleading that every time you remember Brother Booster, you offer a prayer for him. Solomon preached great sermons. Wrote great instructions about the necessity to obey God. The necessity to do things God's way. And I hear him saying, at the end of his writing, he says, hear the conclusion of the old matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. But you know what? Solomon forgot to practice what he preached. Are you going to pray for Brother Brewster? Are you going to pray for Brother Brewster? I mean it. Are you going to pray for Brother Brewster? You know what? Because it didn't only happen to Solomon. The church is filled. The church history is filled with people who preach great gospel and turn and live contrary. And it takes the grace of God to plead, Lord, help me. Help me to realize I'm not better than them, that I need to live daily dependent upon you. I don't ever want to feel I haven't made it. I never want to ever come to a place where I think I am the good preacher with the good knowledge. I need to live, live with the reality. I need to stay in my face. God help me. Lord, help me Lord. One day at a time. Lord, I need help today. Lord, help yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad you kept me safe yesterday. But since today is gone, Lord, I need help today. The church, is, the church has suffered immensely because of Ministers who have preached the gospel high and strong for years and then for some reason have turned and lived contrary to it. Yeah. I can I plead with you. You want to pray for Brother Brewster? Yeah. I'm going to put you in the spot. All who can pray for Brother Brewster, raise your hand, please. Thank you. I just want to throw this in here. It wasn't part of my message. The real problem with ministerial failure and saint failure is pride. If we can always say, look, God, help me tonight. You know something? I want to say this. There is only one individual in the kingdom of God that is infallible. And that's God. Amen. All the rest of us can make mistakes. And if we can just humble and say, God, I need help. Amen. It will save us from a lot of problems. Amen. Solomon began well. Preach high. Challenge greatly. And then went contrary to his message at the end of his walk. I'm afraid tonight there are a lot of people in hell who at some time 
knew God and walked with him and testified for him and preached for him, but somehow the devil tricked them and they lost out. But you know, I got some good news for you. If, the, if God could roll back the curtain, we could find some people in heaven Amen. who began well and strove through the fire, battled through the troubles, permit, per, that maintained their position in spite of all the opposition and came out at the right side. So it can be done. Yes. Amen. Amen. And so we want to look at another character quickly. Who did it the same way? Acts chapter 9. And I'm reading verses 1 through 6 and quickly. And Saul, yet breathing out threatening and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that he found any in this way, whether they were men or women. He might bring them back on to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple of Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision of Ananias, and he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for the holy prayer. And he had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to the saints of Jerusalem. And there he had authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Galatians chapter 1. Verses 11 through 17. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after men. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb, and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Sorry if I'm reading very fast. I'm just trying to cover the material quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verses 8 through 10. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I'm the least of the apostles that I'm not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Verses 
verses 21 through 30. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, wherein soever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in debts off. Of the Jews five times receive I for the stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, and night and a day had I been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I am not hurt? I, I burn not. If I must needs glory, I will glory in the things which concern my infirmities. Second Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 7, lest I shall be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I shall be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. One more portion. Second Corinthians, Second Timothy. Chapter 4. Verses 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous just shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearance. Thank God for Paul. You know, God has been gracious to us in, in, in just letting us know let us not see one day at a time. I think sometimes if we could see all that await us, it probably will cause us to want to quit. But God didn't do that with Paul. The first week that Paul got saved, God sent him a message. And he says, you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer till the day you die. You are going to face all kinds of hardships. How many of us will continue on if we had, had that message sent to us? You are bound for all kind of trials. Your heart, your life is going to be gone. And I tell you, God fulfill his word. Paul, I've suffered like I don't know anyone else apart from Jesus Christ. But you know what? He had, he had gotten a vision of Jesus as his, as his salvation. And that thing sunk down into his heart. Will you please listen to me? I'm not going to keep you long tonight. What we need is an inside experience of Jesus. I'm afraid that too often, oh, we pray, the church of God, now I'm talking about the church of God as we know it. I'm not talking about the Bible church of God. I emphasize too much Outside demands. Amen and amen. Yes, sir. And people are trying to please God by fulfilling the demands of the leaders. Right. Oh, 
And so people are doing it, but their hearts are not in it. And so as soon as they get a way out, they go off in the other kind di di direction. But I tell you something. The greatest commandment, I told you that the other evening, I'm saying it again, in the Bible is not holiness. And you're quiet on me, but it's true. The greatest commandment is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy, you know, when you love God, you want to please him. You don't, I preach this day all the time, wherever I go, you don't have to please him. Do you know that? You don't have to please him. You have the, uh, even when you get saved, you still have choice to decide what you want to do. But when your heart begins to love God, then there is a desire to do it. It's not a have to. It's not a, it's not a measuring up to somebody's directive. It's a matter of God, what will you have me to do? See, that's what, that's what one Paul is victory. The first day he met Jesus, he said, Lord, what will thou? And then he said, listen, after I spoke to Jesus that word, I didn't go up to the apostles for them to tell me what to do. I looked to Jesus. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you a secret. If you do it, he's going to tell you. And Jesus is unworldly. So you cannot talk about Jesus told me that I can live a little worldly. You heard a different, you heard a different message from somebody else. What, what, um, the, the Bible says, the law came by Moses, but grace and truth. You know what he's saying? Jesus brought what God really wants for us to live. And then he brought grace so we can live it. Amen. Amen. God don't demand nothing from you that he don't provide the grace to do. Amen. And so if you fall in love with Jesus Christ, you are going to want to live to please him. The Bible said this of Jesus. He did, John chapter 8 verse 29, he did always that which pleased God. Not because he had to, but something on the inside. Something on the, on the heart caused him to want to. That's what it's all about, saints of God. If you're going to make it to the end, get a, get a love life with God. Amen. Fall in love with God. Amen. And you're, going to, you're not going to want to do anything to displease him. And if you've ever seen a little frown in his face, you're going to fall on your face and say, Lord, help me. Yeah. So Paul went through all his trials, all his hardships, and all his difficulties. And he endured them, and he pressed through. And you know why he could? Because every morning he had a little talk with Jesus. Intimacy with God is the secret of victory. Yes, sir. Intimacy with God will cause you to want to obey him. God encouraged God from the inside. He fought the battle through. And at the end he was able to say, I have fought a good fight. Yes. And I have kept the faith. And God blessed him with a triumphant entry into heaven. One man began well, but because of not following the directive which God gave him, he did not end too good. Another man began well, held on to God, and he made it. And I want you to know tonight, if one man made it, everybody else can. Amen. Amen. If you're here tonight, you might be saying, Pastor, I, I can't get saved because I don't know if I can make it. 
But you will not find out until you get saved. I promise you tonight that God is able. Hallelujah to God. The Bible says he is able to keep you from falling. And to present you faultless. God is able. You might not be able to do it. But God is able. If you fall in love with him. He will be able to keep you. And say to God I don't care how the battle gets. All right, I, do, I want to encourage you with this thought. Don't look around, look up. The Bible says he will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because they trusted in him. There's all kinds of things happening around that will discourage you. But look up. All right, in the Church of God in which I grew up with, there was a song that says, "Turning thy face from all the past onto the goal, keep pressing." And then the second verse says, "It matters not what others do; onto the goal, keep pressing. They cannot run the race for you. Onto the goal, keep pressing." Whether they run or turn aside, whether in sin they still abide, keeping thine eyes on him who died, on to the goal, keep pressing. Trust when we come back next year, I, I can say to you, I made it because you prayed for me. So don't forget. <laughs> I'm going to ask you if you remember. All right? And then I'm going to be praying for you. Because I want you to, to meet you again if we come back next year. And the only way I don't want to meet you is somebody says, God said it was time for you to come home. Well, I will understand that. Otherwise, let's fight together, saints of God. Yeah. Let's determine by the grace of God. Somebody, I don't remember how that song goes. Somehow, but I'm going to make it. You know that song? Yes. Something. I don't know how, but somehow, we got to make it. God bless you, too.